Thank you. So I'm very glad to uh, have a possibility to give a talk in this wonderful conference on statistical mechanics and discrete geometry. So obviously there will be some statistical mechanics uh, uh, since Daimler signed the title. Uh, and, uh, but there will be some theory of Freeman surfaces essentially here. And also a piece of discrete geometry also, yeah, I promise. Yeah. So this uh, area is a little bit new for us. Yeah, so that's the first paper of us on Daimler's. Yeah. So, and this is a joint work uh, with uh, Nikolai Babenka and Yuri Suris, and Nikolai is in, in the room. Yeah. Good, so uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the papers are quite new, and uh, the second one uh, doesn't exist yet, yeah, so, but uh, will uh, uh, pretty soon. So and my talk is based on uh, these results. So what is the setup? Um, well, there were already many talks uh, where the theory of Daimler's was explained in detail, so I will not sp spend too much time on that. So uh, these are uh, Daimler configurations on bipartite uh, planar graph. Uh, all the edges are equipped with uh, weights, and these weights are very important for us. Yeah? Uh, that's the uh, uh, probability, the measure on Daimler configurations. Nu of E are the H weights. And uh, physical weights uh, are phase weights. This is the case when you're factorized with respect to gauge transformation, which are denoted by WF here. And uh, all faces are, uh, obviously have uh, even number of uh, vertices. And therefore, uh, you just go around and... Uh, uh, compose this kind of multi-ratio of uh, uh, H weights, and uh, this is a physical weight. So it has to be real, and then, uh, moreover, there is this Castellan condition that the signature of this W uh, should uh, have to do with the parity of uh, this number of uh, edges, yeah, minus one uh, to uh, uh, n plus uh, one. So this is the physical case. That's the most interesting case, and we're aiming, of course, uh, at this uh, situation. So the edge weights here, they are not uh, positive? No, no. But in the first line, um, when you say probability is the product of mu, don't you assume they should be positive? Okay, so this is a sort of a complexification of uh, everything makes sense in the complex case. Yeah, so news are... Uh, so in the second line can be treated as complex, but they must satisfy this uh, Castellan condition. Then it's, it's physical. Yeah? Okay, moreover, um, the weights are defined in the following way. There are train tracks, uh, uh, which, uh, 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 well, which go uh, like this. Each uh, edge is crossed by uh, two train, track, uh, train tracks uh, labels that are labeled here by alpha and beta in the picture to the uh, uh, left. And there is white vertex, there is uh, black vertex, and the orientation is uh, shown here. And F are two faces. So if you have a face on, 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 on your graph, yeah, so then uh, these train tracks are located like this, they are arranged like this, that's, that's the picture we have. Okay. Now, uh, uh, what kind of problems one might have here? Yeah? So the, the direct uh, approach or the direct problem is the following. You uh, consider first in this setup a plain bipartite periodic graph. You consider uh, weights on this graph. Then you uh, construct Castellan matrix. And using this Castellan matrix, you define spectral curve. And then you investigate your model uh, using this spectral curve and uh, objects that are analytic on this uh, spectral curve. So that's the way uh, from weights to spectral data. So then, uh, of course, you know a lot about what is going on with the spectral curve and uh, what kind of uh, functions uh, appear there. And there is an inverse approach. You may start with this analytic data, just postulate them, uh, have some algebraic geometry uh, with, the, with the corresponding spectral uh, curve and uh, Riemann surface, and recover the corresponding weights uh, from this inverse uh, problem 
approach. So you can go this way or you can go that way. So we will follow the inverse uh, problem approach. So we will start with uh, analytic data. And our analytic data is a compact Riemann surface, not a curve, it's a Riemann surface. Yeah? And with these train track parameters, alphas, which are just points on this Riemann surface. Um, so a very important object here is a meromorphic function on this Riemann surface. Uh, well, this, uh, this theory comes a little bit from the theory of integrable equations with this algebraic geometric solutions. In, in that theory, this function is called beta as a function. I have denoted as BA because it's not so important, yeah? So uh, you have a graph like this, right? You have black vertices and white vertices. And these functions, they're sitting at all black vertices of your graph. And they are functions on the Riemann surface with some extra properties. So you take the simplest meromorphic function somewhere, for example, function one, yeah? Or maybe a function already with some divisors. Sorry, so the graph is embedded into a surface? Right. Where's the, where's it, the graph? It's, 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 it's on a torus. It's on a torus. It's on a torus. It has nothing to do with the... It has Riemann nothing surface. to do with Riemann surface. Yeah, it's an extra parameter. Your function depend on this parameter P, maybe, yeah? So, which is a point on the Riemann surface. Arbitrary point, yeah? It's a function on the Riemann surface. So, and what happens to your function if you pass from this point to this point, yeah? For example, yeah? You cross these uh, train tracks, and every time you cross a train track, your function picks up a zero or a pole. For example, if you go from this point B5 to the point B1, how these two functions are related, you cross two train tracks, and this means the orientation is different. This means this function B1 gets one more pole and one more uh, zero. Multiply. No, no, it's not multiply. It's a new function, yeah? It's a new function. It's a new function, yeah. So, it is determined by its analytic properties, because you know the zeros and the poles, and each time, so they are, uh, they are described by their analytic properties, okay? So that's, uh, that's the setup. So now, you do the following thing. You can see the star, so you have also white vertices, yeah? And that white vertex, you have many neighbors, right? And these uh, uh, functions psi, sitting at all black vertices, and they are all functions on the same Riemann surface. So it turns out that they are linearly dependent. It follows just from these uh, meromorphic properties of these functions, and this is the relation for these functions. These k's, they are just the corresponding coefficients that come from linear dependence of these functions. There's a unique linear dependence now? Right. It's unique linear dependence. Well, it, Maybe in some degenerate, very degenerate case, it's not unique, but uh, it's unique. So here, you see, uh, this function psi depends on p, and p is a point on the Riemann surface. But these coefficients, they are independent of p, of course. They are just linear dependence coefficients. And they are so-called Fock weights, who derived uh, a long time ago, 10 years ago, some formulas for them. Yeah? Some formulas will appear. So you see, we come, from, uh, we come from this inverse method approach with some abstract data on Riemann surface, abstract uh, meromorphic functions, but we have already uh, some linear equation. And uh, we see that these psi's, they lie in the kernel of the uh, Dirac operator. So, and then that's the reason why uh, we are very close to Dimers already. Okay, so, now... So, so uh, I mean, don't you need like a line bundle or something for the Fock uh, paper to work? Yeah, so the, there are two. So you can have uh, one forms in the white vertices, that uh, also what he uh, considers, but we restrict ourselves to the case when we have just meromorphic functions, yeah? So the uh, meromorphic functions at the black vertices that are linearly dependent. This besides the sections of the dual bundle. So you do have a line. Right, right, but you're saying there's no choice in the phi's, or, or is there, I mean, there should be some choice, right, a priori? Uh, 
area? Well, they're, they're unique up to some constant, yeah, so common constant, yeah. So, okay, if you fix the one function to be one at one, one vertex, the, the, the rest is, is fully determined, yeah. So there is no extra information other than the surface itself, right? Your input is just a surface. Yeah, plus my, a Riemann surface. And your output is the weight. But in Fox paper, the input is not just the surface, but also the line bar. There is also a divisor. There is also a divisor, which is a parameter here. It's hidden somewhere. It's hidden line. somewhere here, yeah. So you're right, yeah. OK. OK. So I don't write formulas, and I haven't explained everything. I'm sorry, yeah. OK, now, uh, OK, this uh, theory is complex theory. And Fock weights, which you derive this way, are complex weights. And we are aiming at these Castellan condition weights. So what uh, one can do? one can uh, uh, provide some reality conditions. So now we specify our Riemann surface. We say that this Riemann surface, let us consider an M curve. And this is a Riemann surface with an anti-holomorphic involution. So usually when you draw, when people draw M curves, then you see a picture like this. Yeah? So then, this anti-holomorphic involution is a reflection in this uh, plane, and uh, it has some uh, fixed ovals. Yeah, so these are the points that are invariant with respect to this anti-holomorphic involution tau. This one, this one, and this one. This is the case genus equal to two, and you have the number of real ovals is g plus one, and this is exactly the definition of M curves. And curves are Riemann surfaces with maximal number of real ovals, which is the number of genus, the genus plus one. So you see my picture is slightly different. And I claim that this picture is much better than this one because this is the real, this is the Riemann surface. So what you can do with this picture, they are round disks here, yeah? So you take two copies of this, R plus, glue them together, and get a Riemann surface, and the complex coordinate on this Riemann surface will be just z coordinate in this complex plane, right? So you see the conformal structure of this Riemann surface in this picture, here you don't. Yeah? Okay, and this will be important for us later. Yeah? So now you have two copies of R plus, which is the one half of our Riemann surface. In this picture, it's just maybe half a half, uh, part of, of the surface. There is the symmetric one. And the, we will work essentially with this R plus. This anti-holomorphic involution uh, tau in this setup can be seen, OK, as I have explained, you glue together two copies of such surface. Or you can do the following thing. You can invert this disk in the boundary uh, circle. And then you cover the whole uh, Riemann sphere and not the hole, but with the, uh, but with the corresponding holes, and that's the Riemann surface, yeah? Okay, so the real ovals are now circles, which are shown here. Good, now our points are uh, 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 these uh, train track parameters. They are now points on the Riemann surface, and to get the, uh, the, re uh, the reality condition satisfied, uh, you simply choose them all on one real oval, on x0. Uh, 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 so moreover, uh, these alphas and betas, uh, which you have uh, in your theory, they should satisfy some ordering condition, some clustering condition. So, uh, and in, in the most general case of uh, minimal graphs, when the combinatorics uh, is... Uh, Quite general, this condition was uh, clarified, uh, was established in this uh, paper of Utilier, Chimasonia, Detelier. So uh, it's known how these uh, reality conditions look like. Uh, and for g equal to zero, this uh, I would like to mention that these weights we have seen here, they are just uh, isoradial weights of uh, Kenyon and Kenyon Okonkov. So this is, in a way, a generalization of this uh, theory. Good. What, so can you explain what the ordering condition on the alphas and beta? Yeah, yeah. This, this will come. Okay. Could I could I ask a question? So in Kenya and Okunikov, they show that real positive weights correspond to Harnack curves. Yeah, yeah. This will come. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. So it will be generalization of this. So all the existing theory is incorporated here. But, I, I will but, mention but an M curve is more general. It's more general. There is no curve. It's a Riemann surface. Yeah. So a curve means that you have a Riemann surface with two meromorphic functions on this Riemann surface, and they are related by an equation. Yeah. So here it's more general setup. We have curve with some points. I will explain this later. Yeah. So it's uh, the corresponding point. Yeah. So how this uh, theory. Uh, 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 includes uh, the existing uh, examples. OK, so uh, now uh, simple uh, cases. The square grid, train tracks are shown here. They're oriented in two different ways. Therefore, they carry these labels plus and minus. Uh, and that's the Castellan condition in this case. Yeah. So you see that all alphas, they are clustered in two sets. This is our oval x0, where all train tracks parameters are located. And they have to be clustered this way. Alpha plus, all alpha plus parameters here, alpha minus parameter here, beta plus and beta minus here. If they are located this way, then the Castellan condition is satisfied, if and only if. OK, and same picture for hexagonal grid. Uh, if you have such a picture, then you have three sets of labels, alphas, betas, and gammas. And again, the same picture, the same Riemann surface, but uh, different clustering of uh, train track parameters. Yeah? So they all belong together, and they shouldn't, um, they should uh, somehow be, the set should be disjoint. Yeah? Do you have some like, relative ordering of, for example, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, depending on the order, or not? Well, we, we simply. Uh, uh, we, we simply take uh, this. Uh, the, the ordering is also is also there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the ordering is uh, is in the picture. No ah, no, 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 no. So there, 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 there is no ordering. Yeah. So it's just just a set. Yeah, just a set. So all alphas are, belong together. All betas belong together, and and uh, all gammas belong together. Okay. Now uh, hard thing. So uh, if you do all what I have explained, you end up with these fork weights. Yeah? So and if you write a formula for this fork weight, then it looks like this. Yeah? So and then you say, OK, very exotic thing. Yeah? But I would like to uh, uh, convince you that it's not exotic. Yeah? So what, what do you have here? You have your Riemann surface. You have all these points, alpha, betas, and one additional divisor yeah, on the Riemann surface which is this vector d here. And then uh, you uh, obtain formulas like this for, for, for the weights. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's clear that these uh, weights satisfy this Castellan condition. And they are given by these complicated formulas in terms of theta functions. Yeah, this is multidimensional theta functions that come uh, from uh, the Riemann surface. So uh, what one can say, uh, uh, what are my comments to this? Yeah? First, for g equal to 0, these are isoradial weights. Yeah? And uh, the corresponding functions are rational functions. So here you see the plots of uh, the weights. Uh, two examples for genus 1 case and uh, for genus 2 cases. So the, this is a, a Daimler fundamental uh, domain. And they look like this. So um, this theory covers all w the theory with all doubly periodic weights, yeah? so which is, was uh, constructed uh, already a long time ago. And in this case, uh, this Riemann surface, which appears here, it's a Harnack curve. And your Harnack curve comes with uh, divisors of poles and zeros. And these are exactly these alphas, betas, uh, and uh, gammas, which we have seen already. Yeah? So, uh, uh, these weights, which we uh, have seen in, in the previous slide, they are not necessarily periodic. They are quasi-periodic functions. And they become periodic functions if and only if uh, the corresponding divisors are principal divisors. So just to simplify the picture, I am considering now the case of the square grid. And this is the case. With, uh, this, this case with this clustering of uh, our parameters. So we, have, we still have all these uh, train tracks, 
uh, labels on, on our Riemann surface. And to get doubly periodic weights, these devices should be principal. This means that there should, be, there should exist function with these zeros and with these poles, or equivalently, uh, the Abel map of this divisor uh, should be equal to zero. So this is some constraint. Okay. What exactly is the picture of the The picture, it's, it's a graph of this uh, phase weight. So that's a dimer, fundamental domain of dimer. And color represents you uh, this uh, W of F. And it's, uh, it's not in the discrete case, it's the, the corresponding uh, function is shown, uh, the corresponding smooth function, yeah? So here you should put the square grid on this picture and then get the, your weights uh, uh, from there. Okay? What's for G? How does it look for G equals zero? <laughs> for G equal to zero, G equal to zero, I will, I will consider the case G equal to zero, but a little bit later, yeah? So it's, uh, uh, it, it will always be peri periodic, yeah, for g equal to zero. So is it a, a plot as a function of alpha and beta, the two parameters? No, no, these are uh, parameters uh, uh, <coughs> so of our dimer, yeah? So it's our dimer plane, yeah? Yes, but you need to fix the, the parameters of your train track. Square grid, yes. square grid, and uh, well, I, I haven't specified really, yeah, so what are the parameters here? So I, I wanted to show you just typical pictures, yeah, and uh, you, you see the formula is, uh, is sort of complicated and I don't, uh, I didn't want to go really into details uh, uh, how it is given, yeah. So there is a function and you put your square grid on this, uh, on this uh, picture and get your weights, yeah, so this way. So what is important, what I wanted to say is uh, when these weights are periodic, and this is a special extra condition for these train track parameters. So the, uh, this theory is well developed in the, the doubly periodic case. It's known Harnack curves and so on. Yeah, so here the claim is that you can extend it to, to the case when these devices are not necessarily principal. And this gives you some uh, freedom. And this freedom is useful uh, because it's easier to investigate uh, uh, the model without extra constraints, which you have to satisfy all the time. Yeah? So, so doubly periodic <coughs> is the same as periodic, or uh, what's yeah, the? Yes. It's, it's just in two directions. directions. Okay. In two directions, yeah. So you're on the torus, yeah. So, so we have a, uh, periodic means in one direction, like the last line. Of doubly, periodic. Yeah. doubly periodic. Yeah. Doubly periodic. Doubly periodic. Right. Quasi, sorry, quasi periodic means it gets multiplied when you move. So exactly. the, the graph is always doubly periodic. Yeah, that's but right. The weights not yeah. Necessary. yeah, the graph is doubly periodic, the weights are not doubly periodic. Okay, you see, just a small remark to this. Yeah, if genus is greater than one, then train track parameters, even if train tracks parameters repeat periodically, in this case, it doesn't imply that the weights will, will be periodic. Yeah? Okay. So now uh, let us come to uh, algebraic geometric description. And uh, we will see uh, what is amoeba and polygon map and so on in all this uh, more general setup of non-quasi-periodic weights. Again, uh, our goal is to describe limiting objects algebra geometrically. They will come later, but now what do we have? You have this uh, square grid. We have M curve with anti-holomorphic, uh, the surface with an anti-holomorphic involution and train track parameters with clustering condition. Yeah, so this is our, these are our data. So now, uh, important thing, yeah? So we construct two differentials. D, uh, zeta one and D zeta two. These are normalized meromorphic differentials with residues at these points. This D zeta one has residues at these points, plus and minus one. D zeta two has uh, residues at these points and all zero, uh, zero A periods. A periods are periods uh, over uh, these uh, circles. Now, uh, you see, we consider everything on R plus and uh, integrate these differentials. They are unique and they exist. Can I give you a condition of the alphas? On what? The existence of a meromorphic differential with those residues at those points gives you a condition on the alphas, some period condition, right? 
condition on, on no, no, this. I don't say anything about the zeros of the. No, no, these are only poles. They are only poles. The sum of the residues should be equal to zero, and this is the case. Yeah? So now you do the following thing. You integrate them. Integrate them over R plus. Yeah, start at some point and compute integrals. So that's this uh, integral zeta k, zeta 1 and zeta 2, which, uh, which are shown here. And they're well defined on R plus. Also, the, these are abelian integrals, but there are no periods on R plus, right? So they're well defined here. Now you take the real and imaginary part of them, and they're also well defined. Moreover, uh, there is this proposition of uh, Krichever, who has considered this uh, already 10 years ago, which claim that if you take x1 and x2, or y1 and y2, they are both coordinates on the interior of R+. Plus. So this means that you can use this uh, x's or y's as coordinates here. Okay. So we introduce this S's, which is just a rotation of Y's, just to uh, correspond to the notations which uh, were already established in the double periodic case. Okay, now this is the picture again. So this is our central object, our M curve, with the choice of uh, uh, this uh, train track parameters clustered, genus 2 in, the, in this case, and, and these are two maps, X and S, real and imaginary parts of these integrals. And these are the maps to the amoeba and to the Newton polygon. What is the difference comparing to the theory in the W periodic case? So you have a little bit more freedom. And this means that the number of the ends of this amoeba and the number of these ovals can be taken independently. Yeah? So you, you can uh, do whatever you want. And here, these uh, black points, which are the images of these interior ovals under this polygon map, they are not necessarily integer. So they, they can be arbitrary. Yeah? Sorry, I'm confused by the alpha plus and alpha minuses. Should we suppose there's the same number of uh, alpha pluses and alpha minuses? Yeah. So it's double. It's beta 1 in this case, which is repeated twice. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. OK, so I should say that all the pictures you, hear, you see in this talk are real pictures. Yeah? So these are not uh, handmade. They are computed. Yeah? So in particular, this is a real Riemann surface. This is a real amoeba. This is a real uh, Newton polygon map. I will explain it later yeah, how. Yeah? So you say the amoeba here is really the image of the real part of the two divisor, and the, and the Newton polygon is the imaginary part, or the that's right. imaginary part of the... That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So now, uh, well, something new. Uh, some new formulas for Ronkin function and for the surface tension function, yeah? So in this more general setup. Uh, they are written here, and I will explain uh, how to get uh, uh, how to define uh, Ronkin, uh, how to get formulas for the Ronkin function and for the surface tension. So Ronkin function is uh, free energy for these uh, Daimler models, and uh, surface tension is the, the functional you minimize. Yeah, so very important things. Yeah. So, but here uh, you simply do the following thing. You remember these were abelian integrals. Zeta two is an abelian integral. This is a differential. So this one, this thing is a differential on R plus. So we don't have periods here. And we integrate along some path L. And it's not indicated here in the picture. So, but you go from the boundary to interior of this domain, to the point P. And this is the point P which appears here. Yeah? And take imaginary part and add some extra stuff. So you see that the formulas for uh, the Ronkin function and for uh, the um, surface tension, they're qu quite similar. It's not surprising because they are Lejeune dual. So, but that's, uh, this is a very convenient representation, especially for, for Ronkin function, because it's given in terms of an integral on the Riemann surface. It's one dimensional integral, right? So they are uh, Lejean dual. This means if you take gradient of uh, sigma, you get x's. If you take gradient of rho, you take s's. 
So again, we have functions on P, uh, on the Riemann surface, both of them. But we have seen that this, P, this R plus is diffeomorphic to a member and diffeomorphic to the Newton polygon. And therefore, you simply change the coordinates when you, uh, when you write this rho in terms of x's and uh, uh, sigma in terms of s's. Okay? Uh, so definitions agree with algebraic ones in the double periodic case. Okay, now again, this is a picture, but the picture is extended a little bit. We have seen two different morphisms, these two, but now these two images are also connected by the gradient of rho, gradient of sigma. Nothing surprising because this is uh, the case in the double periodic case. Now again, let me come to the dictionary and explain again what is the difference to the double periodic case? What uh, is more general in our setup? In the double periodic case, you have this Harnack curve. It is given uh, by such a formula. In our case, we have a Riemann surface, an M curve, so which is more general. The monodromies of your eigenfunction of the Castellan matrix, they are Z and uh, W in this case, and they generate you your Harnack curve. In this case, they are just monodromies of the corresponding psi function, which I introduced at the very beginning. You go along the, your combinatorial torus, and then you compare what happens to your uh, meromorphic function at the end, yeah? So these are the monodromies. Main differentials, this what are d zeta one and d zeta two in the periodic case. This is just dz over z, dw over, the, over w. And the amoeba map, that's the classical one, and that's the amoeba map we are considering here. Yeah, so slight generalization. Okay, maybe now, okay, I promised to have some discrete geometry. So, so, so yeah. the output of your picture on the previous slide would be still an assignment of face weights to a graph on the torus, which are quasi-periodic, right? That's the... Yeah. Not on the torus, on the plane. <coughs> okay, on the plane. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now uh, a little bit of uh, discrete geometry in this setup. Consider, uh, I, I mean, uh, all this is also interesting in this trivial case, uh, let's say, of isoradial graphs and the general zero case, yeah? So uh, then you have no holes here, you have just a unit disk and points on the boundary of the unit disk clustered this way, yeah? Uh, the differentials or the integrals we are investigating can be given explicitly in this case, yeah? So these are the differentials. And now uh, let me introduce some important function which is called bloch wigner function. It is defined uh, using the dialogarithm in this way. And uh, from the geometric perspective, it's more, more important than dialogarithm function. It's more symmetric, yeah? So uh, what one can do uh, you can ex extend this function and treat this function as a function of four points. Yeah? And that's the definition. You have four arguments here. You take the cross ratio of these four points and take the value of this function at this cross ratio. Yeah? So that's the definition of this uh, function as a function of four points. Now, you see, you have four points in the complex plane. What you can do with these four points? You take the upper half space and build an ideal tetrahedron with all the vertices of this tetrahedron sitting uh, at this point, Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. And this tetrahedron has finite volume. And the volume of this tetrahedron is exactly this function D. So this means that the function D geometrically, this uh, bloch wigner function, geometrically gives you a volume, the volume of the corresponding uh, uh, ideal hyperbolic tetrahedron as a function of the cross ratio of its vertices. Okay, complex cross ratio, real valued function. Okay, and now, uh, well, in the genus zero case, the surface tension function is given by its direct computation, not really very difficult, but what you end up with is this formula. It's a sum over all the edges of your graph, and for each edge, 
you have two train track parameters. You have the point Z. It's a point on your Riemann surface. It's your magnetic field parameter. And then in the, you have point infinity. Yeah. So, and that's uh, the form, and, and you take the sum over all the edges. So that's uh, the formula for the surface tension. Similar formula for the Ronkin function. Yeah, so this phi is the dihedral angle at the corresponding edge of your uh, hyperbolic tetrahedron, and uh, lambda is the logarithmic length, yeah, so which is uh, written here. Again, uh, well, that's uh, how it depends also on the point on the Riemann surface, on the point Z. Uh, uh, two comments, yeah? So if you take Z equal to 1, uh, to Z equal to 0, just at the center of your disk, then you obtain this formula, and that's a formula of uh, Kenyon uh, uh, for normalized determinant of the Dirac uh, Dirac operator. So that's uh, one check, so it corresponds. And also, amazingly, this functional, which appears here, coincides with the functionals describing discrete conformal mappings. So, so that's completely different theory, so, but that's the same functional. And what is good about this is, of course, the functional is convex, and then it's very helpful uh, for many things. Okay, that was uh, some uh, fragment of uh, discrete geometry, so geometric interpretation for these weights. So an, an interesting problem would be to really to get a geometric interpretation for the case of higher genus, yeah? So which is uh, also maybe somewhere around. Good. So now uh, let us go further and try to solve a problem. Yeah? So that's uh, just a description of uh, uh, this generalization. Um, and now, oh, well, we go in the direction of uh, limit shapes, and limit shapes uh, are given by height function. So this height function appeared also several times here, yeah, so I will not spend too much time on defining this. It's uh, defined on, uh, at the vertices of a dual graph, uh, and uh, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's one-to-one -one correspondence uh, to a Daimler configuration. So moreover, if you solve a boundary value problem, then the boundary conditions are purely combinatorial. Yeah? And uh, an important thing is that the limiting height function, which uh, determines here this limiting shape, converges to a minimizer of uh, this function. It's a surface tension, gradient of h. h is the height function, and this is also a rather old, important result about uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, periodic, uh, uh, also periodic case. Okay, it converges to the minimizer. So uh, what uh, we were able to prove, uh, that's the case of double periodic weights, and you can prove the same results for these quasi-periodic weights. Uh, using these explicit representations for the surface tension functions, you can show that sigma converges to sigma and the corresponding height function converges to height function. So it's, it's proven that you can do the same thing in the quasi-periodic thing, in the quasi-periodic case. So the result is, is valid. Okay, what does this minimizer look, li uh, look like? And now we go to the Aztec diamond case, and so my talk can be seen as maybe a small extension of what we have I heard from Thomas during the first day of the conference, yeah? So maybe I will be able to answer a couple of questions you got about what is there on your slide, yeah? So there will be maybe a slightly more general interpretation of this. Uh, and um, let us try to solve this problem in this setup, yeah? What does it mean, quasi-periodic weights, when you do limit shapes? Because when you had, for example, Aztec diamond, you had the same weights it was periodic, but now it's uh, quasi-periodic, so your, your weights change uh, and because the size of the domain. So this is in the thermodynamic uh, limit. So I, I, can, I, can tell, uh, I can tell you maybe later, yeah, so how one can regularize this uh, quasi-periodic case to the periodic case. Uh, and then you can, see, you, you can see that in this limit, this regularization is not important in the thermodynamic limit. It disappears, but it's, it's a little bit technical, yeah? So, so uh, let me skip this, uh, this, this here, yeah? 
So the weights, they change a lot across the Aztec diamond. How much are they changing the weights across your Aztec diamond? From one side to another. So it, this is thermodynamic limit, yeah? So what, what we are considering, yeah? So you take a fundamental domain, and the weights are quasi-periodic on this fundamental domain, but in, but in the diamond, yeah, you have many copies of this, yeah? So and you take, take the limit. I think the question is, you know, when you say quasi-periodic, yeah. what it means is almost periodic. Because yeah. What does it mean, almost period? <laughs> I have given you a formula for this, yeah? That's what does it mean for me, yeah? Yeah? So it's not general quasi-periodic. So maybe one can, can develop this theory to, for general quasi-periodic ways, define them properly and so on, yeah? So, but this is a very demanding problem, yeah? So, so what we are doing, we start with this finite dimensional data. Our Riemann surface constructs some special weights, yeah? So which cover all the doubly periodic uh, weights, and then develop this theory in, in this case, yeah, which gives us a couple of more degrees of freedom. Okay. But, you know, you like to know that the weights are, you know, bounded or... Yeah. So I think a good intuitive way to think about this is you have, uh, like, the, this wave function that we, that we showed a picture of is, a, let's say, a periodic function in, in the plane, and then you overlay a lattice on top of that where your actual phase weights live. And the periods that just don't match up of the underlying function and the lattice, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a quasi-periodic function of uh, continuous parameter, continuous variables, and then you put some discrete lattice on this. Yeah, yeah but it's bounded, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So we uh, will uh, give a new proof uh, for the result of uh, Bergen and uh, Borodin, and this proof is purely variational. So the, the, the um, and also it works in, on, for more general boundary conditions and in this more general setup of quasi-periodic weights. Okay, so, uh, well, for, to do this, we uh, first define uh, complex structures on, on dimers, yeah? So the first, uh, the uh, paper on this was the paper of Kenyon and Okunkov, which is also 20 years old. So, but uh, the crucial papers for us were uh, these two papers, and in particular the paper of Berger and Borodin, where we have learned about uh, this differential. Let me explain you what uh, does it mean. So, uh, we have introduced already uh, uh, differentials d uh, zeta 1 and d zeta 2. So, they were already introduced. They uh, come from, from the weights, yeah? so from this Riemann surface. And there is an extra differential here, yeah? d zeta 3, which is a differential which is dictated by the boundary conditions. So, it's a boundary condition differential, which is an extra one. Yeah, and for Aztec diamond, you do the following. U and V are parameters on your uh, dimer. Yeah, so they are uh, coordinates on your dimer. So now look here, yeah? So this differential D zeta one has re uh, residue one at alpha minus, residue minus one at alpha plus. D zeta two has one and minus one at betas, and this one, has alternating uh, 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 residues, so it's independent of these two. Yeah? And now you consider linear combination of these three differentials, and U and V are dimer parameters. Uh, they uh, vary in the intervals between minus one and one. So this means, for example, that uh, here U and V lie between minus one and one, and therefore the signs of the residues stay as they are given by this d uh, zeta 3. Okay, now you can do a little bit analysis, compute how, how many zeros this differential d zeta uh, may have. It's the number of poles plus the degree of the canonical divisor to g minus uh, 2. And this, uh, uh, fr from here you can easily conclude that uh, for any point, uv in this uh, open interval, uh, you have two zeros of any inner wall, oval of this differential d zeta. One zero between uh, these points, I will show you the picture later, 
And there are only two free zeros, which you don't know where are they. Yeah? And that's uh, the definition of the liquid region, that uh, if these zeros lie in the interior of our Riemann surface on this R plus zero, R plus zero means this R plus without boundary curves, then uh, this means that UV belong to the liquid region. And uh, Bergen and Borodin have proven that uh, there is a diffeomorphism. So every point P on R zero corresponds to a, to a point in this uh, uh, Aztec diamond uh, square. So this means that we can extend our picture. Yeah? So we had this picture already before, but now we have one more representation for the same Riemann surface, one more diffeomorphism. Yeah? So this is this uh, map UV. And uh, that's, the, that's the liquid zone. This island corresponds to these holes in, in our Riemann surface representation. And here you have uh, these frozen regions uh, of your uh, dimer. OK, so again, let us look at the case of genus 0. Oh. Uh, uh, simple formulas, that's a parameterization of uh, Arctic curves in this case. Uh, in terms of round scans of this function. Okay, geometric properties. Um, so the vector fields, X and Y, so, uh, they were these maps to the amoeba and to the Newton polygon, they are divergence free. Uh, and moreover, um, there is a nice property, the nice tangency property. Yeah? I take a point here in this uh, liquid uh, zone then uh, I can see that the points on these Arctic curves such that uh, they are tangent, uh, so that the corresponding uh, straight line is tangent at these points. And these uh, points are exactly the zeros of this differential, the, the, the zeta. So this gives us a nice geometric interpretation for the zeros and it allows us to control a little bit how many and where and how. Okay. Um, uh, and then also you can prove that uh, parallelism on real ovals. Okay, now an important thing, one can define complex height function. So we have our differential d zeta. Yeah? So uh, you simply integrate it or your Riemann surface. Now we consider everything still on R plus, right? It has a real part, it has imaginary part, and uh, imaginary part is this classical height function. And uh, the real part is, well, uh, what comes from the complexification. Uh, integrals uh, uh, of the difference. Uh, uh, so you, you immediately obtain these results that if you take gradients of this h and gradient of uh, g, then you recover uh, the corresponding uh, uh, points in the amoeba or in the Newton polygon. Uh, then we know all that H can be extended finally to holes and frozen regions. So the same uh, thing is true uh, in this slightly more general setup. And now uh, two theorems. H is a surface tension minimizer. So where you take this sigma function, which, uh, which is a surface tension I have uh, described uh, you minimize this functional, and H is the surface tension minimizer on the uh, on your Riemann surface. Yeah. So, and next theorem is that G, the real part, can be described exactly in the same way using a different variation principle. Instead of the surface tension, you take the Ronkin function, and minimize this functional, and this will be uh, the real part of uh, of this of this H. Okay, so this means that we have three diffeomorphisms in this case, these three, these maps, and now we have these maps relating these uh, th three objects also. Okay, uh, uh, computation. All these formulas can be efficiently computed via short key uniformization. So there are formulas in terms of Poincare theta series for these differentials, 
for the period matrix, for everything. And therefore, all the results we uh, have seen here, they were uh, computed uh, using this, yeah? Now, uh, uh, theoretical predictions match simulations on practical scales, yeah? So let me show you a couple of images. So this is uh, our genus 2 surface. These are points. So you can compute these weights using these uh, fork uh, formulas, yeah, which are quite uh, complicated, but they are computable. Then uh, run a simulation. That's the result of this simulation. And these are the Arctic curves, which uh, are predicted uh, from this theory. You see they uh, fit quite well together. And uh, I will skip the proof. That's a variational proof, as I have explained. Uh, and just show you a couple of pictures in the hexagonal case, so you can treat this case in a similar way. So this surface must be symmetric up to uh, pi rotation. Uh, then uh, similar uh, theory uh, works. And uh, again, you have a diffeomorphism in this case, but now the picture will look as follows. Yeah? So this is our Riemann surface R hat, which is diffeomorphic to the liquid zone of the dimer. There is a covering, that's the factorization of this rotation, and that's the Riemann surface which determines us all the weights. So these maps are one to one, but you see here it's genus one case, here it's genus two, and here it's genus two. So these maps are two to one, these maps are one to one, this is also two to one, because it's a cover, I mean this one, it's a covering. Yeah? And uh, let me finish with some pictures in the hexagonal case. As, uh, as I have explained to you, well, everything was computed. That's a modulation. That's a modeling, yeah? So you see that uh, it's rather difficult to see these islands here, yeah? So, but I will show you just in a, mo in a minute, yeah? Uh, the picture where you can see this better. And the reason for this is that we don't have a rationality condition anymore. These, uh, uh, these uh, slopes, they can have arbitrary angle, and that's why it's rather difficult to see, yeah? So, but uh, now let me show you one more picture. So here you see clearly what is going on, yeah? So, but now let's make them larger and larger. And I think in this case, you can really see these islands uh, quite well. This is a theoretical prediction, and that's, uh, uh, that's a numerical experiment uh, with, uh, with the dimers. Okay, thank you.